Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in uh, to study the Gospel of Mark together. But rather than start in Mark, I feel like I need to start with one of the greatest promises of all, the promise of God in the rainbow, the promise to Noah that when God saw the rainbow in the sky, He would remember His covenant between Him and humans and all living creatures that He would never destroy the world again by water. With as much rain as we've had, it's good to know that this isn't going to wash us all the way. Of course, that's the story of Noah and the ark, and it's controversial, but not between believers and believers. Generally, believers say the Bible is perfect. We believe at our congregation, the Bible is perfect. So Noah's ark really happened like the Bible says, but non-believers, well, there must be something else to that story, and they'll call it a myth. But there are matters that divide Christians. We talked about views about the end of time last week. One of the things that divides some Christians, if they're aware of it, it's far less known controversy, is the multiple endings to the Gospel of Mark. And there are various perspectives. I want to discuss them now. Now, That's the very end of the Gospel of Mark. We're in in chapter 14. But I didn't want us to end our study of the life of Jesus with uh, theological exegetical controversy i want to cover it now and i'll let you know what i think and we can go on go on from there but before we do let's think about prayers for our graduates those are our high school graduates our college graduates mr and mrs huckabee they just got uh, married so congratulations to them as well and then we do ask you to pray because the time is upon us to make decisions about that when we're going to begin regret gathering and what that will look like uh, lord willing so you pray for our leaders at the church here on that and of course we've had a a number of losses in the church uh, recently and the most recent one as far as a member of our church uh, jewel dunn has uh, died over the weekend and uh, jenny thomas uh, jewel's daughter harold jenny's husband nick nian their uh, sons grandsons of jewel uh, have uh, planned a service And, of course, uh, every organization I know of has had regulations and guidelines to deal with, and they're a little bit looser now with with funeral homes. But let me talk to you about Saturday, that a graveside service at Greenlaw Memorial Gardens, that's out East Main, Fernwood, Glendale, and Spartanburg, is going to be held, a graveside service, and anybody can come. However, the funeral home people will be there to keep us very much apart, only... uh, Five or six people can be under the tent. That's still a guideline in place. And this will be a great opportunity. Most, it, it's almost mostly all about honoring Jewel and, and giving comfort to her family. But it will be a time when we're coming together where we can uh, practice our love and respect for each other. I'm not revealing any secrets to let you know that people have a wide range of notions about uh, what we should or shouldn't be doing once we come together with other individuals well you're absolutely feel free to believe to feel to be confident that you know what is right and appropriate but no one will agree with everyone right and there'll be people that disagree with you on that and so it's never my right to in a matter of opinion which this is to force that on someone else and so you may feel it's perfectly fine to shake hands and to hug i promise you there'll be people there that were very very reluctant about that so Let's keep it to a smile and a wave or a nod of the head so that we don't uh, violate the respect factor for each other. We love each other. They'll know we're Christians by our love, and respect is a big part of love. But again, I I, I want that to be a minor part, I know we all do, of our gathering uh, on Saturday to honor the memory of an absolutely magnificently generous, loving Christian woman and example Uh, to us all so let me lead us in this prayer for hope lord help me to hear you say hear, hear you saying i am your hope over all other voices i'm running to you with both hands stretched out and grabbing on to you fill me up with hope and give me a tangible reminder today that hope which never fails is an unbreakable spiritual lifeline In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are afraid of a number of things. Of what are you afraid? And by that, I mean, do you have any phobias? You know, fears, phobias. I've got got one. I have a 
fear of giants. You know, they always have these uh, big names. You know what the fancy name for fear of giants is? Fee-fi-phobia. I know that's, that's dad, very much a dad joke. But, but fear is real. Google quotes on fear. And they'll all say, fear isn't real. Fear is a choice. Let me ask you, if fear isn't real, why does the Bible so many times encourage us to not fear if it wasn't real? I mean, don't fear. I'm with you, God said. I'm your God. I'm going to give you strength and help, but I'm going to hold you up. When Jesus was walking on the water, which would scare the life out of anybody, if you were in a storm and you saw that, okay? Jesus says, take courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. So fear is real, but we don't want to let fear defeat our faith. So when it comes to phobias, here's somebody's list, and there's some really big words. I'm going to take a shot at all the words. I'm sure I'll mess them all up, but here we go. The top 10 most common phobias in people, according to some list, Somewhere, number 10 is triphanophobia, fear of needles. I bet some of you have that. That's a big one, all right? How about number nine, astrophobia, fear of storms. And I like it that the picture is an animal. Our, we have a dog and a cat. They both hate storms. They truly both hate storms. Entomophobia, fear of insects. And I'd like to say a bug that big right there creeps me out. I don't know about you. Cynophobia is the fear of dogs, and this is really a good graphic. Look how big the shadow is and how frightening and how really small the, the dog is. But some people have a legitimate fear of dogs. How about this one? Ophidiophobia. Ophidiophobia. That's the fear of, of snakes. Ophidiophobia. It's kind of fun to say. I don't know if you think snakes are all that fun. Claustrophobia, well-known fear of enclosed spaces. Terra mahanophobia, the fear of flying. And I think that's because when you're there, you're so scared you tear your hands off. Terramophobia or terra mahanophobia. So I, I was working on that one. Here we go. Ac acrophobia, that's a very common one, fear of heights. Most of us have a little of that. Agoraphobia, for those, of, uh, those people who have that, that is a super thing. And then surprisingly, social phobia is listed number one. Uh, that's not just fear of public speaking, speaking, which is usually a big time fear for a lot of people. Uh, but it's, it's fear of what others think, that you're going to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, wear the wrong clothes to a certain event, order the wrong food, speak out of turn, and what people think. I read it was the, the, the third largest root of emotional difficulties uh, in the American population. So those are very, very real phobias. Well, let's go back to the one about snakes. And let me read to you the least favorite verses in the Bible for Christians with phobia number seven, the fear of snakes. This is very familiar territory, at least to begin with. Jesus said to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. We love that verse. We embrace that verse. But the next word causes us difficulty. And, which it means all of this is linked for all time by Jesus, according to this part of the text, together forever. And these signs will accompany those who believe, those who are saved. My name, they will drive out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with deadly hands. Some translations say handle snakes safely. And notice this word, when they drink deadly poison. Like, well, of course they're going to drink deadly poison. Well, it won't harm them at all. It won't hurt them. They'll place their hands on sick people and they will get well. What are we going to do about that verse? Now, we know there's at least one example of something like that happened. Paul's been in a shipwreck. He makes it to shore. He's gathered around a fire and a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, jumps out of the fire or the wood in the fire and bites him on the hand. And the people all there see it. And they said to each other, it's judgment. Uh, he was a prisoner on a ship, but he escaped the sea. But justice is just not going to permit him to live. He's getting what he deserves. But then, and here comes Super Paul, but Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. But the crowd, <laughs> the people waited for him to swell up. They're not offering any kind of emergency care. They just want to see a show or to suddenly drop dead. But they waited a long time. <laughs> it's just, I guess it's just different times. They saw he wasn't harmed. And look what happens. You talk about a reversal. They changed their minds and decided he was a god. All right. The Gospel of Mark is published with three different endings. Your Bible is going to have 
at least two of them, whether they're marked that way, some of them will list all three. One is called the short ending. If you read NLT, it's in there. This is after the, the middle of verse 8 following. They, the ladies that went to the tomb, briefly reported all of this to Peter and his companions, the apostles. Now listen to this verse. Does this sound like Mark to you? Afterward, Jesus himself sent them out from east to west with the sacred and unfailing message of salvation that gives eternal life. Amen. Well, no, it doesn't. But what is the word amen? When does that come? It comes at the end. So at one point in time, that was the end, at least according to some versions of Mark, that you can find. Then there's the long version. That's the one you'll have. And many times there's a little mark. It says verses 8b through 20 aren't in the most reliable uh, text that we have of these but it includes the verse we just read unless you've got the NIV it kicks it out uh, it says amen so there's an end but it keeps on going Jesus and Mary Magdalene other times Jesus appears resurrected the Mark version of the Great Commission that we just read the snakes the poison the demons the tongues the ability to heal the ascension of Jesus and the spread of the gospel confirmed by miraculous signs now I want to tell you just from a literary point of view in terms of storyline narratively that's much more satisfying. It ties up all the loose ends. But then there's what I think, and what I think the general consensus is, the original ending, and it's very short and very abrupt. The women have come to the tomb. They found out Jesus isn't in the tomb. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. End. Fade to black. And that's narratively not a very satisfying end. But let me give you the reasons why the scholars believe, almost without exception, that the book of Mark ends right there. Have you ever played the game called Gossip? Sometimes it's called Secret. This person whispers something to this one, he to him, he to him. And the, the, the funny is, how much has the story changed by, by the time it gets to this guy? Of course, if you have even more people, what are the odds that this person right here is going to get exactly the same story that was shared initially? In fact, if you had to predict would it get more accurate or less accurate as it went along? Then there's the great painting by Norman Rockwell called The Gossipers. This lady starts a rumor, apparently false, by telling this one, she to her, and it goes all the way around till it passes all this many hands till where the story has turned on its head and the lady is accused of what she made up in the first place. It's a fabulous painting. It's a great lesson for us about gossip. But how accurate would the text be if this was the text of Mark by the time it got to this people? That's what's going on here. We don't have any original documents. This is the one Peter wrote or this is the one Paul wrote by his hands. We have copies. In fact, we don't even have first copies. We have copies of copies of copies. And the general thinking is the closer to the time the original one was written, the earlier the copy, the more accurate the manuscript. So, here's what we call evidence like that. The two earliest in time Greek manuscripts of Mark end with 16.8. The oldest Latin version of Mark ends with Mark 16.8. The oldest Syriac version as well as the two earliest Georgian versions end with 16.8. There's none of that. All right, now the second to fourth century church leaders, and they wrote extensively about the books of the New Testament. Clement of Alexander, Origen, Cyprian, Cyril of Jerusalem, they write extensively about the Gospel of Mark, except not one of them mentions anything about a single verse of Mark 9 through 20. Are you getting the drip? Now, by the time you get to the fourth century, the guy named Eusebius apparently is starting to appear these a little bit longer or a lot longer endings. He says accurate copies of Mark end with 16.8. And by the time you get to the 5th century in Jerome, great, brilliant writer, Christian states, almost all Greek copies of Mark do not contain. Now, what's significant about the 5th century? When the King James was translated into English, the very earliest copy they had. They did their work. They got the earliest. They felt the same way. The earliest copy came from the 5th century, and it did include 16, 9 through 20. So your King James Bibles, New King James, a few others like that, will include it. They did not have access to what has been found in the, what, 400 plus years since then. You know, Dead Sea Scrolls and all the other texts. And so we have 
earlier ones. Now, here's the literary evidence. It really sounds like from 920, somebody else is writing. So you talk to somebody about, you know, all, all the churches being online, and you have a friend say, hey, I watched your church last week, and I really enjoyed uh, your preacher Ernie's message. And you say, well, we, you know, thank you very much. What was it you liked about the message? And you say, it was his British accent. I love to hear people with a British accent talk. He has the most amazing British accent I've ever heard, to which you say, I don't know who you watch, but that wasn't Ernie, because he does not have a British accent. And that's what people who can read the style say, well, whoever that is, it's, it's not Mark. And then there's the biblical evidence. You know, we call them the synoptics because they follow the same timeline, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They don't all include the same things, but they're in the same sequence with Mark. Matthew and Luke are until 16.8. And then and they're not alike. They're not alike at all. But you go, wait a minute. Mark 16, 15, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. If that's not inspired, what does that mean? Then the question you're asking is a great one. What doctrines do we lose if that's not inspired? And the answer is none. Do you think God is going to hang us out to dry? He's given us a perfect Bible. You say, but what about the verse you just quoted? Well, there's more than one gospel. In Matthew's version, go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Luke, go into the world and, and preach that repentance and remission of sins is available to all. That's the Luke. So you have repentance and baptism and remission of sins all in the other two ones. But let me tell you one thing you do lose. You lose the snakes. You don't have to worry about that text. It's not inspired scripture uh, anyway. And I was going to show you a cute little snake, but when I sent out the, the Devo promo, one of our members sent out a picture of their son-in-law yesterday. Now listen carefully to a little boy's voice. I love snakes. Did you hear that? I love snakes. <laughs> Well, these are the kind of snakes that, that, that I love right here, and you don't have to worry about it, and that doesn't need to be a controversy. God was way ahead of us, and it's all done in the best uh, interest everybody was trying to do. By the way, King James Bible, if you follow that, you will absolutely go to heaven, as well as all the other translations. So now to Mark 14 and the anointing. There are two absolutely separate anointings in the, in the Gospels. They're not the same. They, are, they have some similarities. Very different, but they get confused. I'll talk about that in just a minute. So here's the first 11 verses of Mark 14. After two days, it was the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a treacherous way to arrest and kill Jesus, but not during the festival, they said, or there may be rioting among the people. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, who had a serious skin disease, as Jesus was reclining at the table, like he's doing there, a woman came with an alabaster jar of pure and expensive fragrant oil of nard, broke the jar and poured the oil on his head. But some there were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this fragrant oil been wasted? This oil might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they, more than one, began to scold her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's done a noble thing for me. And then he quotes an Old Testament passage from Deuteronomy. You always have the poor with you, and you can do what is good for them whenever you want, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. I assure you that whenever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told in memory of her. Then, right then, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to hand Jesus over to them. And when the chief priest heard it, they were delighted and promised to give Judas some silver. So Judas started looking for a good opportunity to betray the Lord. We know uh, this is Passover, depending on who you read. A town of 100,000 is now 250 to 500,000. Some say up to 2 million people. And so the, the evil people who are trying to kill Jesus, the religious leaders, feel like there'd be enough of a following there for Jesus or followers of Jesus. There could be a riot if they had a massive show of force with an army. And that's what's going on. And Jesus, meanwhile, is in the little city just across the Kidron Valley, Bethany, uh, in the house of a man who has the unfortunate name of Simon 
the leper, the translation I read said Simon, who once had a dread disease, but it's literally, that's his name. Now, that's something we can figure out pretty clearly. If this guy still had leprosy, nobody, not even Jesus, would be at his house. He wouldn't be at his house. He'd be unclean. He'd be outside somewhere. That means he's been healed. And what's your guess on how this guy got healed of his leprosy? We got to hear, you know, guess. It's a pretty good guess that Jesus did it. Now, there's a tradition, not in the Bible, that this man is either the brother of the father of Lazarus or the father of Lazarus. So it's their uncle or their father. I didn't write that exactly clearly. He's either their uncle or their father. Jesus being reclining, see the picture over here? A formal dinner and an unnamed woman shows up, breaks this expensive alabaster jar filled with nard. It's a perfume. It would have absolutely dominated the house and the outside surrounding. It's so, so potent and it's so so appealing and it is over the top that nard is a derivative of a plant that grows on the side hills of the himalayas either in india or nepal how much do you think it costs to get that all the way to israel and so the scholars say it's got to be an heirloom that the great grandmother passed to the grandmother passed to the mother passed to this woman saying this is your hope chest if things go really bad you could sell this and you can still live but no, she breaks it over Jesus, breaks it in honor of Jesus, meaning it can, it's gone. The value is gone. It can never be used again. Now, who is it? Remember Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live in Bethany? Almost certainly, Mary, let me give you the proof. Again, the Gospels that tell the story, this all comes in the same time near the Passover. Here's John's rendering of this, and he gives the name. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who'd been dead and raised, he lived. There they, some people, made a supper for Jesus. It includes Martha. She's serving. includes Lazarus. He's at the table. And then, and it says it, Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, took a pound, a very costly spike, nor anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. It doesn't say it was at their house. It just says it was there in Bethany. But these, this, these three in the family are involved in the assembly there and so if this is a relative's home of mary martha and lazarus father and uncle it all works pretty good now this is the second anointing in jesus life by females and mary gets maligned and by the way more than one mary gets maligned in this here's the one from luke very early and in a different town one of the pharisees said to jesus come to my house sit down to eat so it's not a formula he's just sitting and behold, a woman who was a sinner, code language for a prostitute, knew that Jesus sat at table at the Pharisee's house. Similarly, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, stood at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears, wipe the feet with the hair of her head, kiss the feet, anointed them with fragrant oil. And the Pharisee who had invited him started speaking to himself, and that's always code language, for somebody that's up to no good if they're talking to themselves in the gospel, which is a warning to me because I talk to myself all the time, just ask my wife, but I hope I'm not up to no good. But here's what he's saying. If this man were a prophet, he would know who this woman was that touching him, and he wouldn't let her because she's a, well, code language for a sinner or is a prostitute. And here's the comparisons. Uh, one's a sinner, a sinful woman. One's Mary, a different parts of the Bible. One's in the city of Nain. One's at Bethany. Same first name, but one's a Pharisee, one's the leper that's been healed. In Luke, poured on the feet. In, in Beth, Mary of Bethany, pours on head and feet. This woman over here, the sinful woman, washed feet with tears. No mention of tears in Mary's story. White feet with hair, that's the same. The objection in Luke 7 is this is a sinful woman, a prophet. Like if Jesus were a prophet, would know that. Here, Judah says it's an absolute waste of money. So you can see very, very different. There's also like you know, two storms, two cleansing of the temples, uh, two miraculous feedings. There's a lot of doubles in, in the Gospels. So different people, different cities, different homes, different things in the action itself. Uh, one pours on feet, one pours on feet and head, and different reactions. The objections are there, but one's because this woman's a sinner. Yeah, what a waste of money. And so Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, well, the story's together. What do we think about that Mary at Bethany? 
Well, well, she's a prostitute too. And it's not only that Mary. Like I said, there's tons of Marys in the Gospel. Who else gets the reputation of being a prostitute? Because her name is Mary? Yeah, Mary Magdalene, who's very important, who has a relationship with Jesus. Jesus cast out demons from her. She sees Jesus resurrected. So she has nothing to do with any of the things, and she was not a prostitute. But back to the story in Mark. Some unnamed guests object. Matthew says it's a disciple. John says it's Judas. And he points out it could have been stole, sold, sold for a year's wage, a denarii, you know, a single day's wage, so 300 days. Here's an insight. John says, Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And its keeper of the money bag used to help himself to what was put in. But he's not alone. They, at least others, maybe some of the disciples, people there, are scorning her. And then Jesus does this amazing thing. He defends this nameless woman. And I don't think Jesus says, hmm, what can I quote? It just the way we're supposed to be, so filled with Scripture. You know, our heart has Scripture dwelling in it richly that Deuteronomy 15 just comes out. There'll always be poor in the land. You'll have poor. You, it's good to do, help poor, do, poor good, do good things for the poor. But here's what you won't have. You won't have me. And that's just what Jesus does. He stands up for the marginalized. He always stands up for the women. One of the reasons we believe the Bible is true is because no fictional story would ever have women as the first witnesses to any important event, like, say, for example, the resurrection. It's just one of the many ones. But this lady, by her extravagant gesture, thinks she's honoring Jesus. And why not? He raised her brother from the dead. Of course she loves Jesus and she wants to honor him. But she's done more than she knows. Jesus says, she's anointed my body in advance. So, you know, the, after the resurrection the next morning, the women are going to the tomb to anoint the body. That's what you did the first morning. You would also come back a year later. This is kind of gruesome to our mind. But in Jewish minds, this is what they would do. The tradition was they would go and find the bones of the dearly departed, wash them up, and put them in a box and put the box somewhere. So the body only stayed buried in strict Jewish tradition for one year. And then it, Jesus does something unique. Only here in Matthew, this same story, he memorializes her and her gift by saying, whenever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told because she understands how important I am. No. Because she understands I'm going to die. No, she didn't know. He says it'll be told in memory of her. By the way, I've used this a couple of times when I've been called to do funerals and didn't know I was going to have to do funerals about the importance of memory and that we are all creating stories. And at your funeral... People are going to sit around and tell stories about you. And we get the op opportunity to shape some of those stories. But you always got to be living for Jesus because there's going to be something sometimes that you never thought about. And that's this case. So, and by the way, as I'm teaching right now, I'm fulfilling this passage. We're doing that thing. So this woman now becomes integrated into the story of the good news of Jesus. Her story is part of Jesus' story. And friend, you live for Jesus. Your story is swallowed up and lifted up. Because your story is part of Jesus' story. But the story does not end in a happy way because as it started with the evil conspiracy, it leads with a new conspirator joining it. It's an insider. How are we going to do this without causing a riot? We've got somebody on the inside of Jesus' band of brothers and they are over the top delighted and thrilled. So we had this amazing, amazing generosity and incredible Greed contrasted from the woman to Judas. And so this story ends with Judas saying, I'm going to find a way to turn him over. I'm going to turn Jesus over. And the guy I studied with writes this. Michael Card says, For most of my life, I'm assumed it was the washing of the feet of the disciples in John 13 that was the last straw that drove Judas over the edge in his betrayal of Jesus. But the more I look at the story of the generous woman, and the more I listen to Jesus' words memorializing her actions, the more I realize that the apostles never did anything like that, that Jesus said, we're always going to talk about Peter or John or Bartholomew. And he says, I think it might have been that moment because Judas is in it for the money and Jesus is saying this generosity is what's important. That he said, that's it. I'm in it for the money and I'm not going to get it here. And drove him to do what he finally did. That's Michael Card's take and I think it's pretty sound. And as we said, the text says, with the promise of silver, Judas starts looking for the opportunity to betray Jesus, which gets us to truly sacred ground 
the Last Supper. Let me read it and then we'll take it apart. This is verse 12 through 26 of 14 of Mark. After two days it was the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples asked Jesus, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover so you may eat it? So he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the city. A man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him. Whenever the guy with the jug enters, tell the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room for me to eat the Passover with my disciples? That man will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready, make the preparations for the meal there. So the disciples went out, entered the city, found it just like Jesus told them, and they prepared the Passover, which is no small task. When evening came, Jesus arrived at that house with the twelve, and again, they're reclining. It's a good representation in that picture there. And eating Jesus. You can there's no way to say the shock of this. I assure you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and say to him, one by one, surely not I, and that's Da Vinci. That's the moment in Da Vinci's Last Supper. They're all shocked, circles of shock. Groups of three, they're going, surely it's not me. Now, you already know that this is, there's some things wrong. Notice they're sitting at a table, not reclining at a table. And I could go on and on. That Leonardo da Vinci, man, could he paint, but he wasn't the best Bible student, especially if you believe that silly da Vinci Code book. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting little book and a movie, but there's no truth in all of that stuff right there because, well, like you said, he's reclining. But he said, yeah, it's one of the twelve. The one, and then he says, one who's dipping bread with me in the bowl because the Son of Man will go. It is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man had he not been born. The severest woe pronounced on anybody by Jesus. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and so they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many I assure you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in a new way in the kingdom of God. And after singing psalms, multiples, they went out to the Mount of Olives. All right. The scholars have done their work. We know exactly the day and probably the year, if it's AD 33, but they know when Sabbath and Passover and all that stuff was that year, the Passover Sabbath. Nisan is the month that's kind of half of March, half of April, so the 13th of that month, AD 33. Jews from Jerusalem do that meal on Friday. You ever wondered how Jesus could be doing the Passover and yet being crucified on Friday? This is why Galilean Jews, like Jesus and his disciples, follow a tradition begun when they were in exile where they celebrated the Passover on Thursday night. Here was their thinking in fear that they would lose count and do the Passover late, rather than take a chance of doing it late, they started doing it one day early, and it became a tradition for Galilean Jews. That's why, that makes the whole week work. It was on Thursday night. And uh, while uh, Mark doesn't mention who the two disciples are, Luke says it's Peter and John to go prepare. And preparing the meal, the meal is extensive, it's precise, it's demanding. This is a big deal, whoever gets this assignment. This is a big responsibility. It will not be the biggest responsibility Jesus gives to John and Peter going forward. So they get, they get the signal like the water jar. And doesn't that remind you of going to the city? There'll be a man with a colt. And just say, Jesus needs a colt. And they give it to him. All right, now we're going to do some assumptions here. But it really does lead to a neat point. Certain things are true. Unless this is a guy with a house and an upper room, so some money. Unless Jesus has got an intimate relationship with more than one wealthy household in Jerusalem, it's probably the same house as the guy with the donkey. And that increases the odds that this is the same house that Peter went back to in Jerusalem when he's miraculously released from prison. And Acts 12 tells us whose house Peter went to. It's a lady named Mary. It's another Mary. It's not any we've talked about yet. She is the mother of John, who's called Mark. This is Mark's house. Do you get the drift? Now again, it's not 100%. But isn't it neat to think that the initiation of the Lord's Supper 
was in the upper room of the house of the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark. I just love that kind of stuff. That would let you know why Mark has so many details. He's coming up next week in a very interesting cameo, probably. See if you can figure out where that is. Okay, there's a picture of the Passover meal. That's a modern version of it. I am nowhere close to an expert on Passover meals. The Seder, and some of you probably know it a lot better than me, so if I get it wrong, I apologize. This is what I've studied and learned, but I could be wrong. I think this is generally correct, but I do know this is right. It's based on what happened. When the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, nine plagues hadn't done the trick. Pharaoh had not let them go because of his hardened heart. So the tenth plague come, death of the firstborn. Unless you do what? Sacrifice a lamb. Put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost over the door to your home. And when the angel of death comes over your house, what will he do? Seeing the blood, he passes over. You know that's where that came from. So very symbolic. And it's very sensory. A lot of aromas and tastes. They are tangible reminders of both the hardship of slavery in Egypt and the absolute ecstasy and exaltation of being released. So here are the meal. Matzah, we know that one. Unleavened bread. Uh, William Lane, another source for this course, writes, no matter how you spell it, there are lots of spelling. Matzah is the quintessential Passover food. And you very likely use something like that for communion. That's what Peggy and uh, I and Mother are using for communion uh, right now. Well, at a certain point in the meal, called the cup of proclamation, Jesus will take the matzah and break it and say, this is my body which is broken for you. Number two of seven, carpus. This is a green leafy vegetable, probably that, partially. That looks like parsley. And here's what that represents. Remember when Joseph was number two in Egypt? He brought the family down. Pharaoh gave them the land of Goshen. And they absolutely flourished. This represents the good times. When you follow God, there aren't only bad times. There are... Good times, but the bad times make the bad times bad, and the good times make the bad times not so bad. You know what that means? So this is representative of that. Number three, mara or bitter herbs. And I think it's that stuff right there, and usually it's horseradish, which may mean it's that right there. I'm not sure. The, representing the bitterness of slavery. And you say, man, I love horseradish. Grape poupon, uh, cocktail sauce for shrimp. Yeah, that's a little horseradish. Raw horseradish will light you up. It might clear your sinuses. It might kill you. It's, it's just something. So they get a little bit just to remind how bitter lack of freedom is. Number four, the chara set. That's a mixture of fruit and nuts. I think it's that. It might be that. Uh, sweet wine, honey, symbolic of the mortar. Remember that they had mortar to put the bricks together. And then as punishment, Pharaoh did what? Took the mortar away. And the word chara set comes from the Hebrew word for clay. Chairs. Number Five, the shank bone of the lamb, and there's the Hebrew word for it. You can tell that's the lamb right there. There's nothing more significant than the Passover lamb, both to Jews and, of course, to believers. Number five, the egg. That one, I think, maybe that is egg. Maybe that's not horseradish. I don't know. I think that's an egg. And there's the word for egg in Hebrew. It was eaten first, and it shows, it also was the sacrifice in the temple I've read, that, you know, when you bite into an egg, there's more inside than just the shell. There's the shell and the white and the yolk that any time you do anything, it's a journey and there are things ahead and there may be good ahead and there may be bad ahead and don't think there will be no hardships on your journey, but there's also a notion of eggs representing springtime and rebirth. In Exodus, you go through the Red Sea and now you're a people and we go through the waters of baptism and now we're the people of God. They're on the way to the promised land. We're on the way to the promised land. We, yeah, that'll preach forever, I'm telling you. This is all related to what Jesus is doing. And number seven, the Cherzaret, another bitter food. So maybe that right there. But another reminder of the bitterness. And at this point in the meal, they would quote Lamentations 3, 19 through 21. I remember my affliction and my wandering, like in the desert, the bitterness and the gall. You know, that's the real bitterness. Emotional gall is like a chemical in the body that is bitter. I remember them and it brings my soul to the bottom. Yet, I don't stay there. Because I've got something I can call to mind, and therefore I have hope, like our prayer of hope. What do you call to mind? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. It doesn't matter if you're wondering or right on track. The mercies of God are new for you individually, your family, our church, our world, His people, every morning because God is perfectly faithful, which leads to the four cups of wine which come from Exodus 6, 
6 and 7. Cup 1, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Cup 2, I will rescue you from your slavery. Cup 3, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment against anyone and anything that stops you from following me. And I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. No wonder they drank wine or toast to that. But in the meal, they had a certain order, starting with the cup of sanctification, setting apart. That's what sanctify means. This meal always led by the head of the household, saying, this is a special meal. This is a special time we will start, which leads later in the meal to the cup of proclamation, the halagah, the proclaiming of the truth, the telling of the story, which starts with the youngest son of age asking, Father, why is this night unlike any other night? To which the father would tell the story. Our father, we're talking about Abraham, was a wandering Arminian and go from Abraham all the way to the promised land. And that would be a good question to ask around the Lord's table. Why is this meal unlike any other meal? Well, that was before the eating of the matzah. And this would have been where Jesus would have taken the matzah, broken it, and said, this is my body broken for you. Which leads to the third, the cup of blessing our redemption, and you can figure out what's coming here. There's a, a major grace for all things of God, good and difficult. And this is where Jesus takes the, the third cup and said, this is the cup that represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant. And of course, that leads to praise or hallel. There's the Hebrew word for praise. You've got to know your Bible. At this time, everyone recites verbatim all of Psalms 113 through 118 as an act of praise and thanksgiving so that's what i know about the seder and let's look at it the night this most sacred night where jesus is instituting the supper that thursday night of the week of his crucifixion they're reclining so formal meal mark doesn't give much detail but he gives us the essence of the moment especially when jesus says it's one of you there will be tension in the air the rest of the night i mean that's not something you just blow off in fact it, it, that, that's what they're thinking about and probably why luke says when they get to the garden, they're exhausted from their grief at what has been said. Now, Mark doesn't directly implicate Judas, but Matthew says, Judas says, oh, it's not me. Surely it's not me. And it's John that gives that little whispered thing. It's the one who dips the sot with me. That means Judas is sitting on the other side of Jesus from John. That's what we, how we know that. Judas is a puzzle. Some will say he's a helpless pawn. I don't think the Bible says that. I just think he's an, he's an evil man. But there is this. I mean, how could you spend three years, day and night with Jesus, listening to the teaching, seeing the miracles, looking at the compassionate heart of Jesus, seeing the tears and the joy and the provision and the hope and the courage and the determination, and say, I'm turning that, that guy in to get him arrested and maybe even killed. How could that happen? Well, we know that John 13, 2 says the devil is prompting him, and we know that Satan literally enters him later in the meal. But let me show you this. I just learned this, okay? So there's the anointing, and at the end, we just read in Mark, Judas goes to the chief priest. Matthew gives a little more detail at that point, at that meeting. Here it is. So he's left the beat, the the home in Bethany where Mary has anointed Jesus. Then one of the twelve, one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. They're paying him up front. Now get this. That means Judas sitting beside Jesus at this Passover meal has the 30 pieces of silver on his person in his purse or in his pocket now we would say that's cold this is a bad man one verse for jesus in mark to break the bread and identify it as body two verses to initiate the cup from passover to communion representing his blood poured out um, some will say when jesus said unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood right after the miraculous feeding in john that kind of prepared them because this certainly is a carrying out of that and the meals of the passover always closes with some version of this it's been changed now but in those days it was this year in jerusalem next year in the kingdom why because they thought the messiah hadn't come the kingdom hadn't come 
I think the, the traditional phrase now is next year in Jerusalem for Jews all over the world. But Jesus doesn't do either. He modifies it. He innovates and says, I assure you, I will no longer drink the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in a new way in the kingdom of God. And that leads scholars to conclude that Jesus did not drink that fourth cup of Passover wine that night. And then, I just love this point here. I don't know if it'll move you. It kind of moves me. It says the disciples sang a song, and that's the only time in Scripture, it's listed twice, that we have anything about Jesus ever singing. I wonder what his voice was like. I'm thinking he's a baritone. I, you know why? I'm a baritone. Surely he was a... I think he had a wonderful... Who knows? Voice. But singing is, is, is emotion, and, and it, I think it could be joy, and, and if it's so, it's the last light Jesus will enjoy before they move from there out across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives and to the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane. So I just want to close with one question. Do you think Jesus was afraid? We talked about fears to begin with. And I have the answer to that one. The Bible says that Jesus understands our weaknesses, our challenges, our doubts, our, our fears. He faced them all, all the same thing. And he did it without sin, and that qualifies him for what comes next, not just next Wednesday, but the betrayal and the trial and the awesome moments of the betrayal of one of his closest, perhaps his very closest friend. Well, that'll be for next week, Lord willing. I hope to see uh, many of you at the memorial service, the graveside service at 3 o'clock on Saturday in honor of Jewel Dunn and online on uh, Sunday. So stay dry and stay warm. Let's love each other. Let's respect each other. And I appreciate you watching this study tonight. Good night.